well-known faces. So um, first of all, let me say a warm welcome to everyone and to thank you for making the time uh, of this um, afternoon. We have the uh, super privilege to have uh, with us the governor of the Central Bank, um, Mr. Radev. And uh, maybe just a few words from me. Um, I was asked as a board member in this field to, to say, we, we were looking for a topic which will be really relevant and it will be topical, you know, if I may say so. Uh, a theme which will be relevant uh, today, but as well as in the near future. And, um, and clearly a, a very obvious one is the ERM2 uh, that Governor Radev will, will talk about. And, uh, and the, other, the other reason when choosing the topic was that, you know, as Amcham, usually we raise our voice when we don't like something. Uh, but we want we want to make the point also that we also raise awareness when certain achievements are in place. And clearly, us being in the waiting room, uh, being in the ERM tool, it is an achievement. A big credit to the central bank, but also a big credit to, you know, um, all the banks which are members of Amcham, and, and we're very proud of that. So we thought um, it is um, it's a good time to have a discussion. So we have the governor to demystify. Uh, a few things which you know we see in the press, uh, other things which are being uh, talked, discussed, or, or there is a semi-talk on them. So, what better opportunity than this one uh, to have him in person uh, to enlighten us and, and, and give us a better understanding of uh, what's now and what's next? And before doing that, I just want to invite our president Olivier Marquette to to do a welcome address uh, on behalf of Amcham. Uh, we shall then proceed uh, with um, Mr. Radev's presentation, and after that, we'll open it for questions. Olivier, over to you. Thanks a lot, uh, Bojidar, and uh, welcome everyone to, to this new webinar. Um, first, I would like to, uh, to uh, you know, hope that everyone is, uh, is safe and healthy. Uh, I know these are very difficult times, uh, pretty much everywhere I'm following every day the the, the, the progression of the of the pandemic in in Bulgaria and numbers are increasing, uh, but I can tell you that uh, there are those numbers. I mean, look actually very small compared to what I'm experiencing in Brussels, where I'm currently based, where uh, we know Bra Bra Belgium is not a much uh, larger country. It's very comparable to Bulgaria, and there are like literally ten thousand cases per day, basically. So. <laughs> Uh, so I, clearly the pandemic is, um, the second wave is coming. And so I, I, I really hope that, um, we'll, we'll be able to, uh, to, to manage it and, uh, that, uh, you know, uh, everyone, uh, as much as possible is, is safe, um, and, uh, and healthy. Um, so in terms of AmCham, uh, in this difficult time, I think we've made a point to uh, actually be even more active than ever, uh, obviously adjusting to the new environment. So we've we've held we've held a number of uh, of webinar uh, focusing on on our AmCham priorities, uh, and I think this week and next week are uh, actually uh, uh, very very consistent and uh, leading to this expectation. So thank you very much, Mr. Rade, for uh, being here uh, with us today, and we're very much looking forward to. Uh, to hear your uh, and, and to have a, an open discussion uh, uh, regarding ERM2 and uh, uh, on uh, uh, the, the overall uh, environment and, and banking environment in, in, in Bulgaria. I would just like to highlight that next week, uh, we also have a quite busy week. So we have an event uh, on rule of law on, on Thursday with the US Department of Justice uh, focusing on Foreign Co Current Practices Act. Uh, it's going to be a webinar uh, in partnership with the, so the, the U.S. Embassy. And uh, also on Tuesday, uh, transatlantic creation, which is another of, of our top priority. And, and we'll have a meeting uh, with the Bulgarian commercial attaché at the Bulgarian Embassy in Washington, uh, Ivo Konstantinov. And uh, uh, we're going to have the, the, the pleasure uh, to, uh, to talk to him. And I think it's on Tuesday, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, about uh, effectively the U.S. Uh, U.S. Bulgaria uh, business uh, uh, opportunities and, and more specifically uh, opportunities for Bulgarian businesses in the U.S. So um, and so again, we I think we are very happy to uh, to 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 
be very active and, and using uh, webinars to, to engage even more than we used to do in the past. Um, in terms of upcoming events, so I, I just want to, to highlight as well that unfortunately we have to, uh, uh, to, to cancel our traditional Thanksgiving dinner. It's, it's usually a highlight of the year, an, an opportunity to, uh, to celebrate uh, together. Uh, unfortunately, given the, the circumstances, I think everyone will understand that we'll have to postpone and uh, just to, to come stronger next year. Uh, and same goes uh, for our general assembly, which uh, which we hold very early 2021, because it was simply uh, not the right environment, especially given the fact that uh, we have uh, some upcoming board election, and so so we want to make that uh, in a better environment. So for we we rescheduled that for early 2021. So uh, that that's all. Uh, without further ado, uh, I, I would like to give the word uh, to to Mr. Radef and, and wish you all a very successful webinar. Mr. Radev, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, thank you all for the invitation. Uh, it's a privilege to speak to you today, all from a distance. Uh, I was uh, asked to address the European Union's uh, exchange rate mechanism, or the ERM2, uh, recent developments and their impact on the Bulgarian economy and business. Uh, no doubt it's a topical and uh, relevant issue, uh, having in mind that the Bulgarian LEF uh, joined the ERM2 just a couple of months ago. Uh, of course, during the Q&A session, I'll be happy to address additional questions uh, related to the economy and the banking sector. Uh, so now focus on the, on the ERM2. Uh, you know that the ERM2 is a critical milestone towards joining the Euro, uh, area and adopting the euro. It was introduced along with the introduction of the euro in 1999, and it's a convergence criterion for entry into the euro area. Uh, the ERM2 has two main purposes. First, to ensure that exchange rate fluctuations between the euro and the national currencies do not disturb economic stability within the single market. And second, help non-euro area countries prepare themselves for participation in the euro area. Uh, 19 uh, of the 27 uh, European Union members have already joined the euro area. Therefore, the current ERM2 club is pretty small. It consists of the currencies of only three countries, Bulgaria, Croatia and Denmark. Danish uh, uh, Kroner joined uh, in 1999, at the very beginning, and the LEF and the Croatian Kuna joined this year on July 10th. The remaining five European Union countries, Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, Romania and Sweden, have not yet applied to join the club. Uh, by design, the ERM2 is not a complicated uh, mechanism. It is based on an agreement between the finance ministers of the Euro area member states, the European Central Bank, and the finance minister, ministers and central bank governors of the non-euro area member states participating in the mechanism. First, the ERM2 parties agree on the central rate between the euro and the respective national currency. The national currency uh, is then allowed to fluctuate by up to 15% above or below this central rate. Uh, the currency uh, is supported, uh, if needed, by interventions coordinated by the European Central Bank and the National uh, Central Bank in order to keep the exchange rate within this fluctuation band. Uh, however, this is very important clarification, especially in the case of Bulgaria, a country can decide to maintain a narrow fluctuation band, including zero. For example, Denmark, uh, observes a central rate with a narrow fluctuation band of plus minus 2.25% instead of 15%. Uh, the ERM2 is monitored and administered by the General Council of the European Central Bank, which includes the governors of the central banks of, uh, uh, of, the, EU, uh, of the central banks of the European Union member states, including the governor of the Bulgarian National Bank. Uh, this is, in short, the ERM2 regulatory framework. How, this, how does this framework apply in the case of Bulgaria? On July 10, uh, this year, 
uh, the ERM2 parties agreed to keep the fixed exchange rate under the currency board arrangement, namely 1.95583, as a central rate between the euro and the left. Furthermore, based on unilateral commitment by the uh, Bulgarian authorities, the ERM2 stakeholders agreed that Bulgaria will continue its currency board arrangements and would keep the central rate with zero fluctuation band during the ERM2 period. This practically puts an end to speculations that our exchange rate in ERM2 will somehow differ from the fixed uh, rate uh, which has been in place in Bulgaria for over uh, 23 years. So, a few words about the implications. Uh, the obvious first question is the implications uh, for the exchange rate policy. It's an easy one. Uh, as I emphasized, uh, the participation of the left in the ERM2 does not require any changes to the regime of fixed exchange rate under the currency board arrangement. Uh, this was confirmed during our discussions with the ERM2 stakeholders. Uh, these discussions culminated in presentation that I made before the General Council of the European Central Bank in a background paper prepared by the ECB staff and also presented before the General Council. To keep the long story short, both my presentation and the background paper came to the same conclusion, namely that the fixed exchange rate at 1.95583 was a sustainable equilibrium rate that would be kept during the EM2 uh, period. And this conclusion was incorporated in the final decision. So, to put it differently, we're not concerned whatsoever presently and also in the horizon of the ERM2 with the stability of our exchange rate arrangements. Uh, there are various, uh, various indicators that support such statement, uh, but I would, I would like to draw your attention uh, to one of those uh, uh, indicators. This is the sole issue of the currency board uh, that illustrate how much uh, of uh, our high quality foreign uh, exchange reserves uh, stand behind the monetary liabilities of BNB. Technically, the ratio is uh, calculated uh, uh, from the balance sheet of our issue department, dividing the sum of total assets by the sum of banknotes, banknotes and coins in circulation, liabilities to banks, and uh, liabilities to government and uh, budget institutions. The latter is practically the government deposit with the Bulgarian National Bank. Uh, we publish the, the balance sheet uh, every week. Uh, for example, the last Friday date, they indicate that the coverage uh, ratio uh, presently is uh, 160%. Uh, our policy is uh, to keep uh, the uh, coverage ratio well above the minimum required for the smooth operation of the currency board of 100%. Uh, so, if you are interested uh, in the stability of our fixed exchange uh, rate, uh, you can take a look uh, from time to time and uh, at the balance sheet of our uh, issue department. It's, it's uh, very informative and it's uh, easy to read. The ERM2 implications for the broader economy are more important and uh, they're definitely positive. I'll support this with three recent and uh, mutually related events. First, the establishment of a swap line between the European Central Bank and the Bulgarian National Bank. Uh, this swap line was uh, established before, but very much in the context of the uh, forthcoming participation of the LEF in the ERM2. If you take a look at the ECB website, you'll figure out that uh, swap lines with such favorable conditions have been extended only to the three ERM2 countries, Bulgaria, Croatia and Denmark. Uh, and uh, uh, this had, of course, very important signaling effect for the markets. Uh, second, the recent issue of 5 billion uh, debt on the international market, 5 billion euro debt on the international market. The huge interest of the investors and the price were unprecedented, uh, not only for Bulgaria, but for the current market conditions and our progress towards the, the uh, euro uh, area through the participation of the LEF in ERM2 played an important role for this outcome. And third, the very recent upgrade of our rating by Moody's in an environment in which the opposite is more common. You know, a few days ago, for example, Moody's downgraded the UK. 
The rating agency was very explicit in its assessment referring to recent progress uh, towards your accession uh, is in fact the main factor for the upgrade. To summarize, the ERM2 developments lead to better financing conditions, somewhat very important, especially during the difficult times we are in. Uh, what next? Uh, looking forward, uh, we need to address, of course, the questions regarding re the question regarding the RM2 timeframe. Uh, it's very from country to country. Denmark is in the RM2 for more than 20 years, but it's the only country in the EU after the UK is already out with an opt-out clause regarding your adoption. Uh, for the remaining countries, uh, Lithuania litters stayed longest in the ERM2, more than 10 years, the mandatory period being two years. Uh, our aim is to stay in ERM2 for as, uh, for as short a time as possible. Realistically, this suggests 2024 as Bulgaria's year of accession to the euro area. But the more important question is not exactly the time frame, but what needs to be done to get there. First, we need to fully comply with the convergence criteria, the so-called Maastricht criteria. Uh, their purpose, you know, is to impose control over inflation, public debt and public deficit, exchange rate stability, and domestic interest rates. Uh, more specifically, it means that we need to maintain inflation at a rate, at a rate more than 1.5 percentage points higher than the average of the three best performing countries to keep the budget deficit under 3% and the gross government debt under 60% of GDP to keep the exchange rate stable within the ERM2 framework and to keep nominal long-term interest rates no more than two percentage points higher than in the three member states with lowest inflation. So as of today, we broadly meet the four convergence criteria and have uh, good chances to keep it that way if we maintain the sound fiscal and monetary stance, regardless of the current crisis environment. Uh, you probably know that in addition to the Maastricht criteria, the entire process includes prior ERM2 commitments and post ERM2 commitments. We engage to implement prior commitments in six policy areas, bank union, macro prudential supervision, these two being under the mandate of the, of the Bulgarian National uh, Bank, uh, but also non-banking supervision, insolvency framework, anti-money laundering uh, framework, and state-owned enterprises. These prior commitments were successfully completed. As a result, we are a full-fledged member of the ERM2. The post-commitments include additional measures in four of these six uh, areas, uh, uh, and uh, they're entirely under the mandate of the government. Again, this is the, the uh, non-banking uh, uh, supervision, insolvency framework, countiment on enterprises. These policy areas are considered central to the aim of achieving a uh, high degree of sustainable economic convergence and uh, successful participation in the third stage of the economic and monetary union. Uh, you have probably seen that uh, the government uh, already adopted a plan for the implementation of these post commitments. Uh, these areas are outside the direct mandate of the Bulgarian National Bank. In fact, there are no post commitments with regard to the banking sector, which is another recognition for the significant progress in this, in this area. And uh, I'll join to what was said in the beginning by the chair that, yeah, it is very much uh, 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 depends on what we did in the banking sector. It was successful. I mean, the central bank, but also the commercial bank banks. They're, they're extremely, extremely uh, good and uh, adequate in their reaction, uh, especially the period uh, since 2015. Uh, and I think the decision to join the banking union and uh, the decision that uh, there will be no further uh, commitments, uh, specifically for the banking sector, are quite indicative for the progress uh, uh, we together achieved. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Radev. Um, now, I was I was planning to invite someone to ask, but I'm tempted to ask a question myself, um, which would be, 
you mentioned this whole thing will be probably until 2024. Is this the optimal timeline or could we make it shorter? Do we want to make it shorter? Um, what would your view be? I don't think it's realistic to be shorter. So the two year is the mandatory period, but there are a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, logistical administrative uh, issues that needs to be addressed. So two plus one, I think is a realistic uh, time frame. It's a bit ambitious. Uh, I said this many, many times, uh, at the end it's a political project, it's a political decision. Uh, we all face a very high level of uncertainty related to the pandemic, to the political, related political economic developments. Uh, but uh, the same questions were uh, raised uh, when uh, we were preparing uh, for the year 2 and the banking union. There are many voices that the, the timeline is uh, unrealistic. Uh, but yeah, if you take a look at the measure that we introduced in the banking sector, in fact, uh, uh, we, we started on July 12, uh, 2018, and the process was finalized on July 10, 2020. So I think it's uh, realistic uh, and uh, moreover, the, the program of the government and our own program that is very detailed and technical, uh, uh, in fact, uh, work uh, within this, uh, within this time, time frame. All right, thank you. So it, it probably is the time that is needed not only to achieve change, but to achieve it in a sustainable manner. Um, now we move to the Q&A part um, and we have tried, to, we have received some questions in advance and I'll start with them. We will try to group them around a few areas uh, which will be, well, very topical would be anything around COVID and the response related to that. Uh, the banking union, which goes together with the whole year and um, uh, story, therefore, as well as comments around the banking sector. There were some questions on payment infrastructure, uh, and I'm sure there will be, no doubt, there will be also questions on, on overall economic outlook that you've touched on. So um, from those we have received, I would invite our Vice President uh, Stanislava Taneva, who is also happens to be a CEO of Citibank, uh, she has a few interesting uh, questions uh, related to COVID and the way, um, you know, the response was, uh, what happens, what do we expect? Clearly, it is of concern to both um, specialists in the banking sector as well as um, everyone else on, uh, on this uh, WebEx. Tanya, over to you. Thank you, Bojo. Uh, Governor Radev, thank you so much uh, for accepting the uh, opportunity and, and we really do appreciate it. Um, I do have actually um, a couple of questions grouped by, uh, I mean, by the separate teams. Uh, one of my question refers, as, uh, as Bojidar mentioned, to the uh, payment infrastructure in relation to the uh, our Eurozone uh, entry and um, if you can share what's the vision about the payment infrastructure of the country until entry into the Eurozone. There have been discussions around uh, cross-border BGM payments. There have been discussions around rings and Bistera and changes to that, probably if you can touch upon it. And my second question actually is related um, to the COVID pandemics and the response and the measures that have been um, imposed and implemented by the central bank very timely. Uh, however, we would like to know um, a bit more about the measures and for the wider audience uh, and, and in particular, uh, the, uh, the measures that have increased substantially the liquidity on the local market, which was uh, quite high even before the crisis. And, um, we would like to know what are the um, the prospects there? Do you expect any changes? Uh, do you think banks would become more aggressive? What are the results from the COVID measures, if you have them already, in terms of the loan moratorium, et cetera? Probably it's also just good to cover uh, very shortly the measures that have been suggested by the central bank. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Do you want me to respond to? Um, yeah, I would suggest we, okay. we, we take okay. this too and then we move on if, if it's okay. Okay, great. Right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the, the, the both. I think uh, the, the, both groups of questions are very important. 
uh, I, I will start with the with the payment uh, with the payment uh, uh, infrastructure uh, because uh, the things are are clear. We have very 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 detailed plan. Uh, so uh, first uh, first uh, uh, rings and Bicera will cease functioning when you join the euro. It is clear. The rings payments will uh, will migrate to the target platform for euro payments. And the bank lines payments through Bicera will migrate uh, to SEPA euro payments. Uh, of course, uh, the national payments traffic will be entirely transformed. Uh, presently, uh, we uh, are completing together with Borica a project to uh, it should be done to the end of this year uh, for uh, mm, instant level payments for up to 100,000 uh, 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 level. Uh, these payments will comply with the pan-European SEPA credit transfers framework. Uh, so uh, we're well prepared for these uh, 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 changes. I don't believe that we have any, any difficulties, but in any case, it will be quite an important transformation. Also, starting uh, in uh, uh, 2022, I believe in November, there will be a new consolidated target platform, uh, unifying uh, target, two, uh, tar target two, target two securities and tips. Uh, presently, the Bulgarian National Bank, 18 banks in the country, Borica and the central depositories are already preparing for this new uh, consolidated platform. So it sounds very, very technical, uh, but, uh, but uh, uh, it's very much in our agenda, and uh, we work in this uh, area very, very hard. You know, there are certain pain, uh, certain activities that uh, remain under the radar, but they're very important. You cannot see this type of discussions a lot uh, in the in the uh, publicly, but uh, these are things that we're focusing uh, on very much, and uh, I don't think that uh, there is any delay. So we're very much uh, within the the schedule that is uh, included in our plan. Uh, as for the COVID measures, uh, talked uh, about these measures uh, recently uh, quite a lot. Uh, uh, it was recognized that Bulgarian National Bank uh, reacted uh, swiftly and decisively at the very onset of the, of the uh, crisis. Uh, we, we introduced a package of, uh, package of measures for over 8% of, uh, of GDP. Uh, we uh, announced these uh, measures uh, publicly. Uh, they include uh, uh, things that uh, the banks uh, do not like very much. But yeah, among these measures, I could uh, I could uh, refer to the to the full capitalization of the 2019 profit, uh, increasing liquidity, uh, as as you mentioned uh, uh, in your question, uh, by reducing riskier foreign exposures of commercial bank and cancellation of the increase of the counter cyclical capital buffer for this and next year. Uh, we then uh, also approved the private moratorium on bank loan repayments uh, proposed by the banking industry. Uh, I can also add to this list uh, the BNB swap line with the ECB, uh, which I mentioned during my uh, introductory remarks. Uh, this is another major safeguard for financial and monetary stability. Uh, so we uh, we uh, analyze uh, very carefully the impact uh, from these uh, measures. Uh, as I said, uh, these measures uh, further strengthen the capital liquidity position of the of the bank. Uh, that all, that was already very very stable you know, before the crisis. Uh, but this uh, this uh, create the, the appropriate uh, environment uh, for the banks uh, to introduce measures that will mitigate the impact uh, uh, of, the, of the crisis uh, for their uh, clients, uh, the businesses and uh, households. Uh, you can see this. We we publish uh, this uh, data about the moratorium. The interest was quite. Quite big, uh, and uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, in fact, uh, over than 100,000 households and uh, uh, and uh, firms uh, apply and were confirmed by the banks. Uh, so, 
and we should uh, we should not forget that the, the banks uh, in Bulgaria continue to implement smoothly their intermediation function during the the pandemic, uh, which is uh, uh, quite quite remarkable, having in mind the, the huge uh, economic decline. So you raised uh, one very uh, interesting question about the, the uh, liquidity before COVID and uh, after that. Uh, so uh, I guess uh, the, the question is, uh, will this motivate banks to lend more? Uh, indeed, the Bulgarian banks uh, uh, were in a very strong uh, condition when the COVID uh, uh, broke out. Uh, in addition, preparing for the banking union, even before the crisis, uh, we uh, introduced measures that greatly benefited the health of the sector. Uh, lending has remained uh, stable so far. And uh, I want to emphasize this fact uh, once again, despite the, despite the significant economic decline since March. So will banks step up lending? Uh, you know, it's a matter of uh, both supply and demand. Uh, I'm sure the, the, uh, the banks are highly motivated uh, in the current difficult environment to seek good uh, bankable projects to provide financing for. But I've uh, pointed out this on many occasions before. Uh, banks should remain very cautious in identifying and pricing accordingly the risks they take when they lend. Bank lending should not increase at any cost or at any risk, even when banks are tempted to lend more uh, in order to upset uh, earning profits uh, in the crisis environment. Uh, I think I cover I cover the questions more or less. So, if you have some additional uh, questions, I'll address this. No, I uh, I think that's fine. Uh, it, it's just another one. Do you uh, envisage any further measures or, or cutting some of the measures that have been imposed? We do appreciate that we see uh, a second wave and it's happening right now. But what are the plans? And uh, I'm done with the questions. We're thank you. We're monitoring the the situation very very closely. So if you if you ask about the the moratorium, we don't plan at this stage to further extend the the, uh, the the moratorium phasing out in uh, of course uh, we uh, we are ready to to apply additional measures so uh, i'm not going to be very very specific but these measures relate to the to the to the uh, capital requirements uh, but it's too early to to talk about this issue but we have this uh, these things in mind uh, and uh, we'll be we'll be ready to 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 deploy additional measures. No doubt about that. Uh, the, I think the evidence is uh, we are probably the first uh, central bank in Europe that activated the uh, the measures uh, uh, very early in the process. In fact, we we did it uh, more or less in uh, March and very early uh, April, and we're very efficient in this uh, direction. Uh, actually, in fact, uh, we we uh, uh, implemented measures forward. Uh, Nine billion lever, uh, which for the uh, for our for our banking sector for our economy is quite significant uh, amount. So we stay ready to 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 act. Uh, we're very active communication with all the relevant parties, ECB, EBA. Uh, currently, there is discussion uh, with the uh, uh, European Banking uh, uh, Authority and the. Uh, and the extension of the moratorium, I think there is a common position more or less at this stage that uh, we should not go further uh, extending this uh, this uh, this uh, timeline. Uh, but uh, again, we will be ready to act and will act immediately if uh, if uh, if needed. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Um, now, I think. There will be an opportunity for anyone if, uh, else to ask questions if they are COVID related um, a little later. Now, I would, I, would, I would suggest we change a bit the theme, although still related, and I would invite uh, another CEO who doesn't need much of an introduction. Uh, I could see Teodoro Petkova, the CEO of Unicredit, is here with us. Uh, and I know there are some questions that uh, come from 
Unicredit Blue Bank related to the banking system preparation and others, but I, I let her ask them, um, you know, directly. Please go ahead. The first question was about the banking union and the, the impact on the banks, or was it? Yes, uh, exactly. Impact on the banks, and uh, very short, the banks, we are in banking union, but we are not in uh, euro area. So are there pros and cons uh, on the banking system stemming from that? Okay. And I will write the second one in the chat so we make sure I don't hurt the others with the connect. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, I, yeah. I suggest we proceed with this question, Mr. Radev. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So, uh, so the banking bank units it's it's a big topic in fact uh, uh, it goes uh, uh, it goes together with the ERM2 one uh, you you know that uh, in fact uh, we we join simultaneously with ERM2 and the bank union this is one of the specificities of our of our of our path towards the 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 euro adoption uh, so uh, Mm, in fact, uh, 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 since uh, October 1st uh, this year, there is no full month, uh, uh, we're a full-fledged member of the bank unit with all the rights and all the responsibility of the, of the membership. I think it's, uh, it's important to clarify this. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, two of the deputy governors are representing the, the bank uh, in the ECB supervisory board and the uh, plenary session of the resolution board, respectively. And we also we also have our representatives of all the, the uh, committees and working groups of the banking uh, of, of the of the banking union. Uh, so, uh, as I said many times, uh, what we did uh, the last uh, couple of years was to to prepare in order to be a full-fledged member of the bank union uh, from day one. And uh, the reaction of our counterparts now, uh, uh, I can confirm that uh, uh, we're ready to be a full-fledged uh, member. Uh, so uh, there, there are implications uh, in very, very uh, uh, different directions. Of course, uh, they're obvious and uh, uh, most important with regard to, to uh, supervision and resolution. Uh, in fact, uh, the Bulgarian National Bank, uh, with the decision to join the Bank Union, is the first uh, uh, public institution in uh, Bulgaria to its uh, supervisory and uh, resolution function, uh, which is a full-fledged member of the institution of the euro area. Uh, it is true that, uh, in fact, uh, this, uh, this uh, kind of, uh, of uh, uh, decision to, to join the uh, uh, to the bank union before uh, joining to the euro area uh, this is something that is happened for the first time of course uh, croatia follow exactly our approach and in fact the two countries now are members of the so-called close cooperation club of the members of the banking uh, union uh, it creates some some issues but these issues are not uh, dramatic i see uh, much more advantages of this approach uh, rather than disadvantages one of the advantages is something that I mentioned uh, uh, in the very beginning. Uh, it's quite indicative. Uh, there is no post commitment for the banking sector. Uh, as someone mentioned, <laughs> the banking sector also, through this supervision and resolution uh, function, is already to a large extent part of the of the euro euro area. Uh, and uh, uh, in any case, if we follow the traditional path, which will be not the case from now on. For any country that want to join the the banking the European Union, uh, now we should have been in the position that uh, we were back in 2018. So starting with all these exercises that are mandatory uh, before joining the euro area, a comprehensive assessment and everything that the, the banks did uh, during this period of time, we did this well in advance, and it's a quite a positive uh, development. Uh, so the impact on the on the banks uh, will be will be not so so significant in my view. So one thing that is uh, that is in fact uh, uh, see, you can see in the in the in the press is uh, that yeah it will be very very costly for the for the uh, for the banks, uh, which is not true. The short answer is that uh, uh, as a direct result of the 
uh, our, of our participation in the banking union, uh, in fact, uh, the banks will pay less. Uh, and uh, I can explain this. The, the banking union consists, as you know, of two segments, the single supervisory mechanism and the single resolution mechanism. As I said, we joined both on October 1st, and uh, our banks will, uh, following the banking uh, union rules, be subject to fees for covering the costs of performing the supervision and resolution functions. Uh, the new supervisory fees are in the process of being calculated now, but I can say in advance that they will be really insignificant. At the same time, resolution fees that our banks will pay in the coming years will be in fact zero. Uh, that is because uh, we have already accumulated vast sums in our national resolution fund over the last couple of years. Uh, when we joined the banking union, we transferred the, to the single resolution fund uh, 81 uh, million euros of the accumulated funds. Uh, this is our initial contribution corresponding to what we would have contributed had Bulgaria been a member of the, of the single resolution mechanism since its creation in 2016. And the remaining amount collected in Bulgaria, so far over 700 million uh, lever, remains here and our bank's liabilities for future contributions to the single resolution fund will be deducted through it. So the net effect is that the banks will pay less now than they have paid so far. Of course, there will be some, some changes uh, with regard to the, to the specific uh, procedure uh, applied uh, during, the, uh, uh, during the, the supervisory uh, process. Uh, but we have done a lot of things in advance. Uh, you know probably that uh, we made uh, a number of changes in our legal framework, but not only. Uh, if, we, if we add to what the bank, uh, uh, banks did it uh, during the uh, AQR and the stress test, I am referring to both the AQR and the stress test conducted by the BNB, but also the comprehensive assessment conducted by the ECB, and uh, uh, include also the, the, the changes that we introduced in the regulations, and I'm talking for thousands and thousands of pages, uh, in fact, we're very well prepared to, to start the process. Of course, we're making uh, now uh, some uh, final adaptations and uh, also, also with regard to the, to, the, to the working process, capacity, IT. Uh, but uh, the most important uh, part of the, of the work is already uh, behind us. Uh, so I don't believe that the banks uh, will uh, uh, witness some dramatic changes how the supervisory process is, uh, is uh, conducted. Uh, the changes will be, in my view, only in the positive assessment. In fact, we had more capacity, we had more expertise. One should not forget uh, that, uh, in fact, uh, we have free access to, to information that is otherwise is very costly or impossible to, uh, to, 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 to see. Uh, so these are good things. In fact, uh, if, I, if I summarize, uh, I expect, uh, because we're talking at the end for the public, the public uh, will get more uh, at, a lower, at a lower cost. And I don't think the banks will be very much burdened with uh, what is going on. I think beneficial, and if we look even further in the mid to long term, I think these advantages uh, will be more and more uh, obvious than the possible disadvantages. Frankly speaking, I cannot see any dis disadvantages uh, except some, some technical issues that is not very problematic to address. Thank you. Um, Fantastic. Thank there, you. Is, uh, there is one more question um, from uh, Mrs. Petkova, but I know there is a question from Martin Petrik, which is related to what you just talked about. So maybe I ask Martin to, to say what he wanted to ask, which is about the cooperation between ECB and BNB. And then we'll, we'll go back to the, you know, to the question of uh, Theodora. Yeah. Martin? Yeah, thank you, Pujita. Uh, Mr. Governor, uh, I would have uh, also a question related to that one, to the banking union. Uh, I think you partly answered it uh, because uh, uh, you, you uh, had some statements about that one. So from 1st of October, as you said, uh, five banks will be directly supervised uh, by the ECB in Bulgaria. Uh, how, how do you think this, this cooperation between the National Bank, Bulgarian National Bank and the ECB in this respect uh, would look like? That would be the first part of my question. I would have also a second one. Uh, 
obviously the ECB uh, might uh, in the in the light of the uh, ECB supervision of these five banks might have some uh, rulings or some resolutions uh, do you expect uh, as uh, Bulgarian National Bank also to automatically adopt that uh, for the Bulgarian banks which are not uh, which are under the direct supervision of the Bulgarian National Bank so that would be the two questions thank you okay okay thank, thank you, you. Uh, a few words about the cooperation uh, uh, I, I I don't want to be very polite but the two is that this cooperation is excellent and it started not now it started uh, it started uh, a few years back. Uh, ECB played quite a quite a central role in this uh, process. Uh, probably you remember if you return a few years back, you will see that in fact nobody nobody wanted to discuss these issues with, with Bulgaria. In fact, uh, we started a very good uh, cooperation and discussion on these issues with the ECB. It was uh, institutionalized, which is also very important. Uh, so this cooperation and the confidence that really at a very high level. Uh, so we continue uh, what uh, we uh, use uh, to do the last uh, couple of uh, years, especially after 2018. Uh, and uh, I do believe that uh, this link will be uh, even more uh, productive uh, in the future. Uh, so uh, uh, with regard to the five banks, uh, uh, Yes, uh, uh, this is uh, this is the decision that was uh, uh, that was based on the rules applied by the ECB. There is no surprises; we knew this in advance. Uh, and of course, the same approach would apply would apply for the for the rest of the banking system. In fact, we are talking for an integrated model. We are not talking for two separate models. The model is very integrated. Uh, we have our people in the in the teams that will that will uh, uh, that will. Uh, uh, be responsible for the five banks, uh, but the final sanction will be made in, in Frankfurt rather than in Sofia. So there will be no very dramatic uh, uh, changes in the model. And something that uh, I figured out, uh, I knew, but uh, it was confirmed during the last uh, couple of years, is that the banking sector is very well regulated. If you apply the regulation, it's very difficult to, 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 to get a, a different result. So in fact, we didn't have because uh, we didn't have any differences with the with the European Central Bank during the comprehensive assessment. We were very closely involved in this uh, in this exercise, and uh, we knew well in advance uh, what will be the the outcome of this comprehensive assessment. So no surprises, and I don't expect that uh, we will witness any any surprises like this in the uh, in the in the future. But uh, what is very important, we are focusing on this uh, uh, now. Uh, is yeah of course uh, the, the the membership implies uh, uh, and require complete aligning of, of supervisory rules uh, standards practices uh, between Bulgaria and the euro area. Uh, so from the point of view of the banking uh, industry, industry uh, this makes a qualitative new stage of the European uh, integration. Uh, other things equal, we may uh, expect intensifying competition, efficiency, pressure, and perhaps consolidation. Uh, and this is strategic direction of the, of the development of our, of our banking sector, which I, which I um, outlined uh, a few years back. So this, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, developments related to the banking union uh, will further accelerate this process. It is a good thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Governor. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, maybe here again a question around um, with further. Maybe it's too detailed, but still it's around the, the cooperation with, with, uh, with ECB. What happens, Mr. Governor, if, say, an intervention is needed? So who takes the decision? Is it BNB or BNB? is it the central bank here or is it ECB? And then when it comes to, say, dealing with a situation in the unlikely event of such happening with a large international bank, so one of these five, um, who owns the decisions? Who will drive the process? How different would that be if this relates to a, say, large local bank, whichever it is? And then how different would that be if it is a one of the smaller uh, banking institutions? 
the shortest and simplest uh, answer is CCB, uh, but it's a bit more, more complicated than that. So uh, I, I mentioned this in the case of the AM2. The same approach applies for these other issues as well. So, yeah, PCB intervenes in the case of, uh, of uh, uh, ERM2, but, and it's uh, written explicitly in consultation with the, with the National Bank. Uh, moreover, uh, during the, the, this period of time, when our currency is part of the uh, ERM2, uh, uh, in fact, uh, all, the, all the administrative facts related to any kind of decisions uh, can be issued only by the Bulgarian National Bank. Uh, that's why we introduce uh, we introduce changes in the legislation to ensure that uh, that uh, uh, these administrative facts, uh, acts in fact uh, will reflect will reflect the respective decision of the European Central Bank. So I would say yes, uh, this is the European Central Bank with the final word, but it will be in consultation with the Bulgarian National Bank. All right, thank you, thank you. Maybe we go back to the question of uh, Mrs. Teodora Petkova, which is on the chat. I'll do a, a quick summary of it, which basically is, we have a banking sector, which is, which we could be proud of. Uh, it's well operating, uh, liquidity is where it should be. Capital is at levels that, you know, uh, many other countries would envy. Still, we're entering a crisis, which we thought, or some people thought it would be shorter. Now it seems it may have a different uh, horizon uh, and therefore different implications. So are you preparing for somewhat more negative scenarios and what would this, um, you know, envisage? Is, uh, and I would invite Mrs. Petko to correct me if, if, I, if I did the wrong interpretation of any of that. Perfectly interpreted. And like a forward looking, uh... A view of uh, the governor, how do you see the banking system uh, one year from now, how we are going to deal with the challenges? Okay, okay, thank you. I, I get this. Uh, uh, you know, uh, we're always, uh, we're always, uh, uh, we're always uh, uh, a bit more conservative than any other institution when we're talking about the, the, the macroeconomic developments in the future. Uh, we applied this uh, this approach uh, during the stress tests uh, back in 2016 and after it in 2018 19 uh, so uh, we applied uh, in fact the, the worst possible macroeconomic scenarios when we in fact uh, when we in fact assess uh, assess our banks uh, there are even some critical remarks that force the banks to do things that will never happen or to prepare for things that will never materialize. Now we're in a situation when these worst scenarios are materializing. That's why our banking sector is, is ready. Of course, looking ahead, uh, we uh, are also uh, very conservative. Uh, we just uh, published uh, 10 days ago our latest macroeconomic uh, uh, forecasts and uh, you can see that they're uh, more conservative this than the, the forecast of the government, the forecast of the International Monetary Fund uh, and also uh, some other some other uh, international uh, organizations. Of course we're looking for the for the worst possible scenario but uh, because of the very high uncertainty it's very difficult to assess uh, the, the uh, parameters of this of this worst scenario. Uh, we're concerned with what is going on presently. Uh, so the, the, the situation with the pandemic, a number of, uh, of uh, records already uh, uh, were broken. Uh, so yeah, there are a lot of uncertainty of what is going on to, to, to happen. And we try to be ready. Uh, the only possible uh, way to, to be ready is to be, to be ready for the worst possible scenario and to to, to hope that uh, this scenario will not materialize. This was, in, in fact, our approach uh, back, in, uh, back in June this year. Uh, I personally was very skeptical that the, the economic decline uh, will be a double digit in Bulgaria. In fact, it was 8.5% uh, 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 and uh, quarter to quarter 10%. Uh, we then projected that the annual annual decline of the economic of the economy will be will be 8.5 uh, percent. Uh, now our latest assessment is 5.5 percent. 
So the high uncertainty is, the, is an issue that is discussed. Uh, so the, the annual meetings of Diamond and World Bank, uh, uh, the, 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 they're going on now. And uh, this was the main topic. It's very difficult uh, to see a projection that is uh, not revised. Uh, unfortunately, after this uh, initial uh, stage, uh, after uh, the second quarter, when the uh, international organization improved some of their, their assessment, now we're going in, the, in a different direction. Current developments elsewhere, but also in Bulgaria, uh, add some, some additional questions. Uh, so, yeah, we try to be prepared for the worst possible uh, development, and uh, that's why we try to, to be preemptive. Uh, what, uh, what we did uh, back in March, uh, asking for uh, additional uh, uh, capital and uh, liquidity, uh, was, yeah, it was not something that uh, was immediately needed uh, uh, back in uh, March or, uh, June or uh, April, but it's something that, yeah, the banks need to, to be prepared for the worst possible scenario. That's why I mentioned, I don't want to be very specific because uh, uh, don't want to to create any 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 uh, false expectations, but yeah, we have some some other instruments to prepare even for for for, for the worst possible scenario. There are many on the side of the the management of the capital position of the bank, but again, I don't want to be to be very specific. Yeah. Much appreciated, and yes, clearly uh, there is an understanding that um, there is a a borderline where sensitive information uh, comes, and probably it's not necessary now to be discussed or debated. Link to this, I mean, can you compare us or draw an illustration? As to how, how do we look compared to everyone else in Europe, um, the other banking systems? Because we've been welcomed to the banking um, union uh, and therefore now benchmarking in one or another way uh, would probably be of relevance uh, also for us, for our own comfort, but as well as for the others in the banking union uh, how comfortable they, they, they see us as a partner. In fact, we, we were welcome in the banking union because our banking uh, sector was uh, so very solid. Uh, in fact, uh, in fact, uh, uh, if, uh, if, if we take into consideration the, the main uh, uh, indicators, uh, capital adequacy, liquidity, coverage ratio, well, all the profitability, uh, profitability indicators, return on equity, return on assets, uh, our indicators are uh, better than the U average. So the only indicator that uh, that uh, uh, we uh, 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 we you cannot compare uh, favorably uh, to the U average is the level of the non-performing loans. But uh, again, there is very steady decline on performing loans, especially after 2015. The current level is slightly above 6%. The U average is, is about 3%. Uh, so, uh, and when we're talking about concerns, it, this, is, this is obviously one of the concerns that we have, that we do not uh, have uh, to uh, reverse this situation with the non-performing loans, but it is not unlikely, I should say. Uh, so, yeah, in general, we, we stay very, very uh, well in comparison to the, to the average uh, indicators or in comparison to the banking sector of a number of countries. And uh, it was recognized. Uh, one should not underestimate the decision uh, for Bulgaria to join the banking uh, union. Uh, in fact, the banking union was established in 2012. Uh, and uh, after that, there is no country that joined the ERM2. Uh, so the, this uh, this uh, this uh, uh, developments with the bank union it's new for Bulgaria, but it's not a conditionality that is surprising or that discriminate Bulgaria. Quite the opposite. So the purpose of uh, of, uh, of this uh, exercise to join the bank union uh, and uh, one of the main conditionalities uh, were related to the stability of our banking sector, and this is something that is broadly recognized. The fact that Bulgaria is part of the bank union is recognition for the stability of our banking sector. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the, the Bulgarian system is stable. Uh, we, we are uh, cautiously satisfied with what is going on during the crisis in terms of the banking sector. Uh, the lending is, is, is continuing. Uh, the, the indicators uh, remain very, very stable. 
But again, as I said until the last question, uh, we should be prepared for, for negative developments, and this is what we're doing. All right. Thank you. Maybe we change a bit the, the tack and the, the theme. There is a very interesting question from Valentin Gelobov uh, from TBI. I cannot see on the list if he's on the WebEx now, but if he is, please. Um, yes, I could see you now. Please go ahead. It's on a, on a slightly different, well, on a very different topic, but I think still of, of, of quite of a relevance for our, uh, I want to believe, innovative country. Valentin? Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, would, I have a short uh, question. Uh, my question is related to so called uh, sandboxes, practices, and regulatory sandbox. And uh, Mr. Governor, would you comment uh, from the regulatory sandbox perspective, which are areas, allowable areas, where the most advanced fintech banks would play around? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's, it's a very, very good question. Uh, I would like to, to, to recall that earlier this, uh, earlier this year, the Minister of Finance uh, announced the uh, intention to promote uh, the setting up of a regulatory sandbox in Bulgaria. Uh, needless to say, the Bulgarian uh, National Bank is closely involved in this, uh, uh, these plans, in these discussions. Uh, of course, I should recognize that we're still very early in the process. Uh, but uh, and probably will spend uh, more more uh, time and uh, resources uh, after the pressure coming from the process of joining the RM2 and the banking union on this uh, on this issue. Uh, but yeah, that in order to be short, I'll say that the very the very concept of, of uh, sandbox is aimed to allow banks to to experiment in the fintech uh, area. Uh, there are various uh, initiatives, uh, including in organizations uh, in which uh, we are uh, very active. You probably know that the uh, Bank for International Settlement, uh, based in Basel, this is the bank of the central banks, uh, establishing innovation uh, hub. Uh, we, we, have, uh, we, have, uh, we, we participate in a number of uh, initiatives of this innovation hub. It's a good news for us that this innovation hub is, uh, is uh, headed by a good, uh, good colleague and friend, the former uh, member of the, of the executive uh, board and the governing uh, council of the ECB, Benoit Curé. So there are a lot of things that are going on in this direction. We try to, to be very active in this uh, field, but I should recognize again, we're still very early in the process. All right. Thank you. I am looking at the chat right now, and there is an interesting one also from Georgi Drensky. Um, how do you expect the banking sector to develop in view of the number of banks which are currently operating? In the last years, we did see some consolidation. Uh, I would allow myself to add also a comment here uh, based on what I see in the other Balkan countries that in other countries, actually, the, the number of banks has shrunk you know, quite significantly. Do you expect more consolidation? Could this continue in Bulgaria? Yes. Yes, it's a short answer. I, I, I've referred to this many times uh, from the very start of my, of my mandate in the Central Bank. And uh, I think, yeah, competition and uh, consolidation and things like that, uh, these processes will accelerate, in my view, uh, especially once. Uh, based on the, on the current uh, developments, uh, and second, based on uh, uh, what uh, what we did joining the banking union, uh, so these uh, these things will be catalysts uh, for for a process like this. The consolidation is one of them. It's not something uh, that is specific for for Bulgaria. It's something that uh, stay in the agendas uh, uh, in many other places, not only in Europe. So, yeah, I, I expect that uh, this process will accelerate, uh, but again, it's very, very, uh, very premature to be to be specific, uh, and, uh, including with regard to the time frame. All right. Thank you. 
Nadia, do we have any other questions? At least I don't see here on the chat. Uh, one from Mr. Jock Newnan. Uh -huh, yes, but yeah, I, I just saw he... Jock, do you want to step in? You said it was answered. I, I don't know entirely, but yeah, Jock. Hi, Bojo. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi. How's the sound? Good. It's good. It's good. Yeah, I can hear. Yeah, I think I think the, the most interesting thing, and important thing for, for me to hear today from the governor, um, for businesses in and investors in Bulgaria, is the the commitment to keep the exchange rate fixed for the period of the RM2. Um, I'm wondering, you know, is there a scenario that the governor foresees where they may not be able to keep the exchange rate fixed? No, you could add also the tax rate to keep it fixed at 10%. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, uh, I'm not very confident about the tax rate, although I am, uh, I'm one of those that support this very much. But yeah. uh, with regard to the exchange rate, no doubt. It, uh, so the alternative scenario that uh, I'm resigning immediately, but I cannot see it objectively. Uh, I don't believe that uh, such development is possible. Uh, I uh, refer, that's why I refer to the to the coverage ratio of the, of the currency board. Take a look at the balance sheet of the issue department. So we keep it and uh, it's approximately at this level, 150% plus minus. Uh, of coverage uh, uh, ratio. Uh, we do not see any pressure from the fiscal policy, although although there are certain decisions, but nothing dramatic that could change the situation. So there is no pressure coming from the public finances. There is no pressure from the point of view of the monetary regime. Uh, so frankly speaking, I don't see any, any, any scenario, even theoretically, uh, when we will be uh, forced to, to, to reconsider uh, the level of the of the exchange rate, and uh, don't forget, uh, it is something that uh, we introduced 23 years ago. I've participated in I don't know countless number of uh, discussions, and uh, many people have been concerned uh, over the over the years. So yeah, it's 23 years. Our our exchange rate arrangements, uh, in fact, uh, have never been compromised, neither neither in bad nor in good economic times. So you can you can refer to what happened during the, the global financial crisis. You can refer to what uh, what is happening now. In fact, we're strengthening further our position. If if look at this, I refer because it's very easy to read and see, but there are a number of other indicators. And in fact, it was in the in the core of our discussion with our uh, ERM2 parties, uh, partners. Uh, in fact, uh, the discussion about the exchange rate, of course, is, is very central because the RM2, uh, by design, is something that uh, try to, to to achieve uh, exchange rate stability. So it was discussed, it was broadly recognized. There is no single uh, voice at the very end of this discussion. I'm referring to the broad range of uh, ERM2 uh, counterparts. So it includes, again, it includes uh, the the European Central Bank. Uh, it includes the, the 19 ministers uh, of uh, finance of the Euro member countries. It also includes the finance minister, central bank governors of the of the ERM2 uh, uh, countries. So this issue was uh, discussed in length, and I know that there are many uh, people uh, who started the process uh, a few years ago that had their doubts or wanted to consider different scenarios, but I think now everybody is uh, is uh, very much uh, uh, clear that, uh, that uh, yeah, we'll be in a position and to, to, to keep the fixed exchange rate uh, during the, the year M2, and I, I don't have any, any doubts about it. In fact, this is, I said this <laughs> several times, uh, it's a religion for the, for the bank, uh, the people that know the, the internal environment uh, know that it's a, it's also a cultural phenomenon. Uh, there is one minor thing at the beginning of this uh, year that creates a lot of uh, noise uh, because, yeah, the, the, the public and the politicians were concerned that something will happen with the, with the currency board, which was not the case. 
so no doubts about that no no alternative uh, scenarios and uh, i don't believe that we'll face any any issues uh, when we're referring to the monetary regime the monetary regime is, is rock solid great to hear that um i wish we hear the same for the tax rate um and actually there is a there's a logical next question which came from uh, just came in from maria yaneva maria if you're on maybe you ask it yourself because it's 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 much better to you know entertain a conversation than me reading it yes do you hear me yes very good yes. Uh, hello uh, can you uh, share with with us uh, do you have some concerns related to the political situation in bulgaria and could it affect negatively in long term the progress of uh, erm2 well, it's a, it's a, <laughs> it's an interesting uh, question. Uh, I, I I talked about Larry Summers uh, in the beginning, that he said, okay, I'm, I'm not burdened with official function. I can say everything. Uh, so unfortunately, unfortunately, I'm burdened with official function. I cannot say everything. Uh, but yeah, the 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 political tensions uh, in general do not help, regardless of the specific uh, situation in Bulgaria. Uh, at the same uh, at the same time. Uh, and uh, we all know this uh, that uh, in fact uh, the political the political cycle does not necessarily translate into economic cycle and uh, uh, i expect this will be the case uh, next uh, next year uh, as well uh, of course the political framework is critically important but uh, but uh, if we, we are in the position these things are linked but if you're in a position to keep the fiscal stance, to keep the monetary stance as is, uh, I don't expect that political developments will have, will have this huge impact on what is uh, going on. And uh, the evidence is uh, what uh, what happened recently. Uh, the, the, the debt that we issue, because all these things happen after the, the political tensions, uh, tensions broke up. Uh, also the upgrade of the country. We should not forget that the credit agencies uh, take into consideration the political uh, situation. Uh, so, unless uh, we make some, some dramatic uh, mistake with regard to our uh, fiscal and monetary policy, I'm confident that uh, nothing like that happened with the monetary policy. I'm also, also uh, confident that uh, uh, we were not going to to, to face some dramatic uh, developments in the fiscal uh, area, regardless of, of some recent uh, decisions. But if you take a look at the data, uh, we will see that uh, from a macro point, uh, uh, from a macroeconomic point of view, there is no uh, no uh, issues that uh, could suggest that uh, this uh, fiscal stance uh, will be will be. Uh, uh, lost uh, yeah I, I i political tensions do not help but uh, if you follow our path if if there is a consolidation uh, which is a difficult thing in bulgaria uh, for key critical issues uh, i have not seen any criticism now from any uh, public institution from any political parties uh, with regard to the put towards the, the euro area the plan that was adopted was uh, was uh, was uh, published uh, in fact was uh, not even commented which is a bit surprising uh, by the by the observers by the politicians uh, my personal impression is that uh, despite all the differences uh, between the political parties and the main uh, institutions uh, the put towards the, the euro area is something that is broadly supported it's also uh, critically important uh, we show in the past, which is a positive example, for example, what, uh, what happened with the currency board or, or what happened with the fiscal position of the country. We keep this fiscal stance for more than 20 years now. If you take a look at the data, it's quite unique. There are very few countries, if, if any, that, that have achieved something like that. In fact, for more than 20 years, uh, we achieve a broadly balanced budget. It's quite remarkable. Currency board. If, 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 if you open the, the newspapers uh, 20 years ago, we'll see what will be concerned that, yeah, everything will collapse, will not survive the competitiveness and so on. Uh, so, yeah, and uh, we pass through different political, political uh, cycles. There will be a new one, 
probably there will be further fragmentation of the political framework, which is not a good thing. But again, I do not uh, think, looking uh, mid to long term, that uh, this will be very dramatic for the economic uh, development of the country. Of course, there are some downsides risk that could have immediate impact. For example, one of them is uh, posing a big, uh, big uh, infrastructure projects, uh, higher fiscal spending, which is inevitable. Uh, so the very idea, and because we keep a close contact with the Ministry of Finance and the people that decide on this issue, I know they're thinking. In fact, they share something that I've, uh, I've uh, emphasized many times. The idea is not simply to spend more, the idea is to spend better. So we're entering in a very important cycle, and this is an issue that the political class should resolve. Uh, we, we're going now from protection to transformation of the, of the, of the uh, economy. Uh, and it's quite challenging. So if you take a look on the, on the recovery plan of the EU, uh, EU the recovery fund, we'll see that uh, over 30%, probably 33% of the resources, in fact, are devoted to activities related to green economy. Uh, what does it mean? Who is discussing this kind of issue? So the devil is in the detail. Uh, so if, if the political class is in a position regarding the, the, the specific political arrangements to manage uh, this, trans, uh, this, this transition from protection, recovery, to transformation of the, of the economy, will be very successful. I know this is uh, challenging, but uh, this is, in, in my view, is the main, the main risk. Thank you. I mean, yes, you're right, it's challenging, Thank but uh, complement to the banking system and to the supervisory, you know, institutions, despite all these uh, challenges we have here, uh, it seems like you, you, you managed to weather uh, well this, um, all of that uh, so far. There is one question. It's true, if you allow me, it's true. I yep. should say something positive for the political class, not only for the, for the current uh, government. Uh, but we are one of the good uh, examples of, of the independence of the, of the central bank. Absolutely. Some people do not, uh, do not believe it, but there are a lot of evidences. Uh, so these uh, reviews that were organized, I'm not referring to the specific reviews of the central bank. Uh, I initiated and went through very, very serious uh, reviews uh, by, by uh, uh, independent uh, external uh, institutions. So the independence of the bank is, uh, is recognized. Uh, and uh, yeah, there is no pressure from this point of view. It is very important. I think it's already part of the culture. Hopefully this thing will stay like this and it's not going to change. But uh, for the time being, yeah, this is also a thing that uh, needs to be, to be emphasized. Yeah, very good. Um, we have eight more minutes, and um, there is one question from Wian Petkov. I will invite him to uh, ask the question himself, um, if he could join Wian. Oh, hi. Uh, Mr. Radev mentioned the negative publicity around the introduction of the currency board arrangement two decades ago. Uh, in this respect, uh, Ms. Radev, do you plan some uh, educational communication compa campaign uh, on conversion to the euro in this process in order to counteract on negative publicity and uh, uh, some conspiracy theories? Thank you. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, this should be, however, uh, led by the politicians. I had the chance to, to raise this issue with some of them, to say, okay, you cannot uh, uh, rely on this, that, okay, you don't have any firm views on this, and we should convince you that you should do something. Uh, so the politicians should be very much con uh, convinced. And after that, all the, all the uh, institutions, the professional institutions, such as uh, BNB, uh, should uh, participate very actively. Of course, it's a capacity issue. I share this with uh, with some colleagues of the of the, of the uh, central banks in uh, in the euro area. Yeah, it it involves a lot of uh, resources, and we're pretty much uh, engaged in what we're doing the last uh, uh, few years. Uh, but yeah, there are a number of initiatives uh, we try to publish. If you if you check, probably there is no uh, single day. Uh, without uh, publication based on information provided by the by the BNB. 
Uh, but uh, I know this uh, uh, because we have discussed this issue uh, issue uh, with uh, with my colleagues. So we can go and we'll present the things in a in a way that is a bit more technical. The people usually are not very much interested uh, if you present the things that way. And we could, we can make a very serious uh, kind of uh, kind of uh, uh, analysis. And uh, for example, when we started the process of uh, uh, entering uh, the ERM two. Uh, in fact, we prepared a big paper, very big paper. It was presented uh, shortly with all the advantages, disadvantages, costs. But everybody agreed that something like that could not be could not be sold publicly. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's a bit a tricky tricky issue. The, one should not forget that uh, that uh, I heard this somewhere. That yeah, the whole idea of the of the euro could be <laughs> could be destroyed with one sentence. Uh, if, if a politician uh, go and say, "Look, the prices will go up three times," so you can present any 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 kind of any kind of education communication, the idea could be killed. So politicians should be closely involved, and everybody, according to to their mandate and uh, their expertise, should present this. So very happy we do this uh, from time to time. We go when we're invited uh, to present our, our views. Uh, I try to be a bit more open. Uh, than traditionally in the central bank, uh, but uh, yeah, we'll be, we'll be, we are ready, in fact, uh, to do so. And I do believe that something like that will happen, especially when uh, we uh, uh, we are closer to the to the uh, introduction of the euro. So we'll need at least one year, probably eighteen months, a number of measures, uh, how how to prepare the public uh, for the introduction of the of the euro. And this thing will happen, but it will require it will require broader broader support. If you take a look at the at the press, and uh, have you seen have you seen something that is uh, uh, politicians or even the the, the other uh, the other uh, big institutions with uh, very explicit and very clear support of what is going on? Uh, it's very rare. It's very rare. So I can, I can can refer here to to two of these institutions because it will be not fair. Uh, they are very supportive. This was the this was the the the, the uh, syndicates and the, the organization of the of the employers. So they are very explicit in their 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 support. Uh, but yeah, it should be a common uh, common effort. And uh, if there is a common effort, the central bank will be very uh, active uh, with the expertise and all these uh, kind of techni technical things that is to be to be presented in a way that uh, that will be, yeah that the public would uh, understand. Thank you. Um, I think we reached the point where um, um, I would say we need to say a big thank you uh, to the governor. And, uh, and a big thank you to everyone uh, for making this um, WebEx. At the very high point of it, we have like 71 participants, which is uh, which is great. Clearly, the, the topic and the presenter attracted lots of interest. Um, and uh, and we know we see now that there were lots of things to be proud of and uh, to be happy with, to feel comfortable that, uh, yes, there are challenging times ahead of us, but uh, we're in a good shape. and. Um, and we wish that other institutions in the in the country will, will follow the, the role modeling that uh, the central bank is doing in, in many aspects. So once again, thank you very much, uh, Governor Radev. I would like to invite everyone to stay for a minute. Turn on your cameras for the uh, corrective photo we are doing. And um, someone will tell us when it's this happening uh, so that we know. So please do turn on your cameras.